Hello? Mr. Moderator, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. Okay. So, so maybe I'll go first. Yeah, yeah, definitely, yes. All right, thank you, thank you. Yeah, so good evening, uh, Zimbabwe. My name is uh, Tendai BT. So, the, I've been asked to speak on the last 10 president, Zimbabwe's drive into the unknown. Um, it's, it's quite clear that in 2013, we came with, uh, up with a new constitution uh, for Zimbabwe, which was ad adopted by the referendum that was carried out on the 21st of March uh, 2013, in respect of which 93% uh, of the uh, participants, representing about 3 million people, uh, voted uh, for this constitution. So this constitution in section 89, uh, uh, defines the office of the of the, of the president, pre president, and in chapter five of the constitution, it sets up the office of the president. In section ninety one, subsection two of the constitution, the constitution is very clear. It says the person is disqualified for election as president or vice president if he or she has already held office as president under this constitution for two terms, whether continuous or not. And for the purposes of this subsection, three or more years' service is deemed to be a full term. This therefore means legal uh, that uh, uh, Mr. Nangagwa, to the extent that he has served from 2018 and is now on his second term, cannot and will not be eligible to be president of the Republic of Zimbabwe uh, again. Uh, but but there there are as you said we are entering into a unknown a, 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 a territory your topic is presumptive uh, of the uh, common cause legal position that the constitution imposes a term limit but what your topic fails to uh, recognize that uh, elsewhere on the african continent it has become fashionable to actually change uh, term limits and for sitting presidents to actually push uh, for three terms. We have seen the attempts of Abdullah Wade in Senegal uh, to, to, to change the constitution to a third term. We have seen the attempts of uh, Wade's uh, successor, President Sal, to actually change the constitution. We have seen the successful attempts uh, of President Watara or Cote d'Ivoire of actually changing uh, the term limits uh, and, and pushing uh, the term limits. We've seen Denis Sasangueso do the very same thing uh, in uh, the uh, Congo, uh, 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 Brazzaville. We've also seen the same thing happening uh, in, 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 in Rwanda. Uh, we've seen the failed attempt uh, by uh, 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 you know, you know, you know, uh, President Joseph Kabila in the Democratic Republic of Congo to extend the term further, but even if he failed to succeed, he was president for more than three years after the term of after his term of office uh, had uh, had uh, ex 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 expired. Uh, I want to say that uh, legally. Any sitting president who attempts to change the constitution uh, faces the hurdle posed by section 328 of the constitution of Zimbabwe. The constitution of Zimbabwe makes it clear that uh, if someone has to change the constitution uh, and if someone has to change a provision in the constitution that sets time limits or term limits, and remember, in the, our constitution provides term limits for different offices, including number one, the Speaker of Parliament, the President, uh, executives uh, in the in the in the in the in the in the army, uh, the Chief Justice, and many others. Uh, so the constitution says in section three hundred twenty-eight, uh, subsection uh, six, that where uh, if a constitutional bill is passed by two-thirds of parliament and it amends a constitutional term, i.e. It, it increases a constitutional uh, term, that constitutional amendment 
must be subjected to a referendum. This is so in terms of section 328, subsection 6 uh, of the uh, constitution. Now, one can get a referendum, one can actually get a yes uh, in a referendum. We know that Zimbabwe's political context, uh, context is not even and equal. We've just come from a contested election, and I'm going to come to that election uh, very soon. Uh, however, uh, when we negotiated this constitution, and I was one of the negotiated, one of the negotiators, we put in a provision, uh, uh, section 328, uh, subsection uh, 7, which makes it clear that a, a constitutional amendment extending a term of office shall not benefit uh, the incumbent. So if Mr. Mnangagwa, in his wisdom or lack thereof, were to push for a constitutional amendment to extend or to remove uh, the uh, limitation, pro the two-term limitation provided by Section 91, Subsection 2, that amendment would not uh, benefit him. So if you want to amend the constitution, to amend constitutional terms, to increase constitutional terms, the law says it can't uh, benefit you. Now, we saw in, in, in Senegal that President Wade tried to do this. So we put in a provision in, in the constitution, which we called uh, uh, colloquially the Abdullahi Wade provision. This provision is, is section 328, subsection 7 of the constitution. And this says now that, uh, so you now have two things. The first one is the amendment to the constitution that you would have done, that requires the referendum. Then you have a provision that, subsection 7, that says you can't benefit. Now, the constitution then says, if you want to amend section 328, subsection 7, which says you can't benefit from an amendment of the constitution because, which is extending a time limit, you have to go to another referendum. But here is the, here is the uh, double protection. The two referendums, the one in respect of which you are amending the, the, the constitution to extend the term limit and the constitutional in the referendum in which you are amending section 328, subsection 7, so that you remove the provision that says you can't benefit from it. The two referendums can be held a, 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 you know, you know, you know, simultaneously, concurrently, they have to be a separate referendum. So that means that if any sitting president wants to amend the Zimbabwean constitution and wants to amend section 912, which provides a term limit on the president, he requires three things. Number one, sorry, four things. Number one, a constitutional majority, two thirds of uh, the of, 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 of parliament. Then a constitutional referendum that approves uh, that constitutional amendment. And if he wants it to benefit him, another, another parliamentary, two-thirds parliamentary majority in respect of which parliament agrees to remove section 328, subsection 7, and then a second uh, referendum, which makes it extremely difficult for uh, for uh, the uh, constitution to be amended and to allow a president to 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 serve a third or a fourth uh, uh, term. In my view, so this is the legal position. I thought I would explain uh, the legal position, but I'm here to give uh, a, 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 you know my thoughts on the political economy uh, of of our country in the uh, next five years. I think that. Um, there, there are five critical things that are going to determine how this country is going to move uh, forward uh, in the next uh, five years. Number one, we have undisputedly a contested uh, election. The SADC report, the Commonwealth, the, the SADC SEO report, uh, SADC election observer mission report, the report of the Qatar Center, the report of the Commonwealth Observer uh, 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 Mission, uh, President uh, Good Luck Jonathan's report for and on behalf of the African Union, all agreed that this election did not meet 
electoral uh, standards. I like the concluding uh, 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 paragraph of the uh, Sadiq report. So it is an election that is fraught and arrested by the challenge of uh, uh, illegality, by the challenge of illegitimacy, the same challenge of illegitimacy that arrested the 2018 election. And as a result of that tag of illegitimacy, we went through five years, 2018 uh, to 2023, through a shadow, through a polity of conflict, through a polity of uh, uh, toxicity, of, 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 of division, of uh, 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 stagnation, uh, of uh, ossification, uh, uh, if, if, if you like. And I will speak about the economy uh, 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 a little bit uh, later on. So the danger then is that uh, we can't reproduce, we can't reproduce the contested consensus of the last five years in respect of which Zimbabwe has operated on the consensus of a discord of uh, division and toxicity with all the consequences and multiplier effect of that uh, uh, division. Uh, we saw the total collapse of public uh, services, total collapse of public service uh, 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 wages. This economy uh, can't uh, is uh, you know can survive another five years uh, of uh, stagnation uh, and and uh, ossification that we've seen between 2018 and 2023. So the critical one of the critical determinants of how we move in the next five years is whether or not there is a political dialogue whether or not inspired by uh, by Sadiq, whether or not there will be a, 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 a dialogue between President Munangagwa and President Chamisa to create a soft landing uh, for Zimbabwe. There are many efforts towards this, and I refer to what uh, uh, Dr. Mandaza is trying to do, the idea of a national uh, transitional uh, authority. So, so the first determinant of how we are going to move forward is whether or not we can create a soft landing for the Zimbabwean crisis uh, through the dialogue and through some accommodation of uh, some sort. And this can't be just right. an elite pact. It has to be a, a, a qualitative process that is targeted at uh, uh, reforms. The second issue that is going to be a key determinant is how we manage uh, the, 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 the economy. How we manage the economy right. is going to be determined by whether or not there's some kind of uh, political, uh, 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 you know, you know, solution. Uh, uh, but the following right. are going to be key things. I'm, I'm, I'm winding. Up. The following are going to be key things in the management or lack thereof of the economy. Number one, are we able to manage the exchange rates? Are we ma able to to uh, control budget deficits? To control a broad money supply because it has got a cataleptic effect uh, on inflation. Are we able to continue? Uh, are we able to live within our means? What I used to call uh, uh, eating uh, what we kill. Are we able to conduct structural reforms uh, in the economy? Are we able to deal with the corruption and illicit financial flows that are costing uh, this country? Are we able to deal and affect the deep state that is killing the, this economy, as we saw, for instance, in the gold mafia? in the Gold Mafia uh, documentary. Number number three is a critical determinant of how this country is going to move forward is, is the question of the international community. Are we going to be able to engage and re-engage the international community so that all forms and barriers of isolation are eliminated? Are we going to be able to successfully negotiate the uh, the debt Zimbabwe's debt uh, 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 overwhelming debt burden, which is now 130 percent of GDP, the answer to that question is 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 political. Are we able to unlock the political uh, uh, gridlock? Because you cannot decouple international re-engagement from the political toxicity associated with stolen elections, violence, incarceration of activists. Job Scala has been in prison uh, for more than a year. So the international sector is going to be key. But there's another dimension of the international sector that I want to mention. Uh, there is a move towards the creation 
of a multipolar uh, 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 world. We see what is happening in BRICS and, and many efforts. We see the growing influence uh, of, of, of China and, and so forth. There's nothing wrong with that, uh, and we encourage that. What, however, uh, I, what, however, I see is uh, the emergence of a new polarized world between the West and the East, uh, Russia and China, in BRICS on one hand, and the West on uh, another hand. And I see this a situation where Zimbabwe will unwittingly uh, uh, take a side and become a pawn in a much larger geopolitical fight, which we shouldn't be concerned with at all. We are too small, too insignificant to be part of that uh, fight. In, in fact, I would make the same case for Africa. Africa's contribution to global trade is less than 3%. That means that we have no fight in the emerging uh, 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 discord and discourse uh, of this multipolar uh, discordant as I would uh, uh, want to uh, submit. So that attempt to incorporate ourselves in the discord of uh, this emerging uh, 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 you know, you know, insanity, for a lack of a better word, will also determine how this country is going to move uh, in the next uh, uh, five years. Uh, uh, lastly, as a major determinant, is the succession question. The succession question is now with us because the constitution puts a full stop on Mr. Mnangagwa's uh, term of office. He, he has three choices. Number one is to allow the constitution is, as it is and not to seek an amendment. Trying to seek an amendment to section 91 uh, of the constitution and to section 328 uh, will create major uh, conflict in the country, and by conflict, I'm not necessarily talking of physical, uh, uh, you know, you know, you know, conflict, but it will create such a matrix of instability, including potentially the intervention of uh, of, uh, of the army. Uh, so it will be dangerous. So let's assume that he, uh, that debate is not on the table. He is not going to. Uh, he's not going to do that. And for his sake and his legacy, I hope he's not seduced into the fallacy of thinking that he can actually uh, amend the uh, the constitution. But I've heard him say 2030, uh, uh, and to me as a constitutional lawyer, that can only happen if uh, uh, chapter 5 of the constitution is amended and if section 328 of the constitution is amended. But assuming we are not arrested with the uh, the insanity of a constitutional amendment. The next question is, who actually uh, succeeds him? Uh, if if he dies, and, and I hope he doesn't die, if he dies, the position is clear. Whoever is his uh, vice president takes over. Remember, we removed the running mates uh, provisions of, 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 of chapter five. But if he doesn't uh, die, it means that the, the succession question is with us. Does it mean that uh, uh, Vice President Chiwenga will take over or there will be another war uh, towards uh, uh, succession, just like uh, the same uncertainty uh, that we experienced uh, in, the, in the period of uh, President uh, Mugabe? So to me, these four things are going to be critical. Four or five things are going to be critical. Number one, are we able to create a soft landing for Zimbabwe in light of a contested election? Number two, are we able to carry out the uh, massive structural economic reforms that are required going forward? Number, number three, are we able to carry out a program of eco international uh, re-engagement that can break the barriers uh, of isolation? Number four, is Zimbabwe capable of uh, succession. So far, we've been unable as a country, 44 years of independence, this country has not been able to carry out a succession. It was not a, it was not a legal succession in 2017. It was a military uh, coup. So this is a great test for the main actors. It is also a great test for Zimbabweans. So we as citizens, I think, have a say. We mustn't be innocent uh, 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 bystanders. So I submit that there must be agency of the citizen so that we are not objectified by elite rapture, uh, which is as foreseeable 
is it is uh, uh, unavoidable. So I, I, I would submit, uh, Mr. Chairman, that we need citizen agents in parliament, in civic society, in the courts. Some of us are constitutional lawyers who will be taking many uh, constitutional uh, 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 you know, challenges and so forth. So ultimately, if we have a strong citizen, I think we'll be able to mitigate some of the potential excesses that will come uh, from the thesis that I've just presented above. I will stop here for now. Thank you, Mr. Beauty. Thank you for for that uh, submission. Uh, I see Mr. Mpofu, Dr. Mpofu is, uh, is available again. Uh, if you could uh, uh, unmute your mic, Dr. Mpofu, and take the floor, please. Mwabile, please go ahead. Yes, hi, good afternoon. Um, uh, thank you. Hi, hi. Uh, yes, um, I, I, I just uh, had a question for Mr. Beatty um, because of uh, certain uh, statements that he just made. Um, we have a new constitution. Um, ZANU-PF is a whole political machine. Um, what makes you so sure that now we have a constitution and we have Idim Nangwagwa um, going on to his uh, final, second and final term. What makes you think that uh, Zanopiov cannot produce another leader to lead Zimbabwe? Yeah, please go ahead, uh, Mr. Beatty. Okay, can you just allow a, a few comments so that I can just... Oh, okay, a few others. Okay, you can yeah. answer them at the same time. Okay, we've got another request to speak from... Uh, uh, Dan, uh, Danny, please go ahead. Hi, thank you. Thank you. Please, admit, yeah, sure. Thank you very much uh, for this platform, and uh, I'm glad this is Mr. BT on on the on the stage here. My question is, um, well, first of all, I'll pass it off with a comment. Uh, the election was said to be fraudulent you have decided or your party has decided to take part in this fraudulent uh, parliament or constituted by fraudulent election. Uh, how on earth are you going to be able to achieve the, some of the things that you have promised to achieve? Uh, taking into account, now you have taken part in this, in this fraudulent uh, result. Now uh, you have legitimized ANUPF. Now... Um, you say that you're going to participate, but we all, this, you are returning to the cycle that we have seen over the years. Complain, this time you just keep caught, get into parliament, and then blame ZANU-PF where you have failed. How are things going to change this time without taking alternative steps to address the problems that we are facing? Because this looks like the easy way out, uh, if you have to ask me. And I think it's shameless that your party has decided to participate after declaring yourselves that this was indeed a fraudulent election instead of fighting for instead of fighting for a re-election while you are out pressure put yourself under pressure to, to to do some work but now we see you're in the same parliament we know what the result is going to be and how are we going to hold you accountable what kind of things are you gonna? Uh, 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 are you trying to achieve? Because when there is process saying, "Oh yeah, we're gonna have an early election soon," what happens if you fail? Because we know you're going to fail, <laughs> and blames are PF uh, sabotage. I would like to have some clarity regarding that. This is not an attack. I just want clarity as a Zimbabwean who now has to be represented by an entirely fraudulent parliament, <laughs> a de facto government that has no legal basis to call themselves, you know, honorable. This is very dishonorable, I'm sorry to say. Uh, many thanks. Thanks, uh, Danny, for your contribution. Uh, I think we'll return it to Mr. Beauty. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much. So, let me ans answer the first question. Yes, ZANU-PF is a, is a machinery, uh, and it is precisely because of that machinery that uh, this constitution uh, was created uh, 
uh, on the on the in in the phrases that I've uh, spoken, uh, you know, you know, I've just uh, highlighted. Um, a good constitution is based on mistrust. You actually mistrust the incumbent. You actually assume that he's going to do terrible things, and therefore you create a legal framework, a legal infrastructure that seeks to uh, vaccinate against the, the potential insanity, against the potential derogation. So the provisions of the constitution dealing uh, with uh, term limits were actually based on utmost mistrust that whoever is going to be a president in this country will want to amend uh, the constitution. So, so there is there is treble protection. The first one is that parliament there must be two thirds uh, parliamentary uh, 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 approval of the bill amending section. Uh, 91 of the constitution, the two-term uh, provision. Secondly, you've got the protection of section 328, subsection 7, uh, which says uh, if you amend a term limit, it will not benefit you. And again, to amend that, you need two-thirds majority and you need a, 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 you know, a referendum. And the two referendums can be held uh, together. I don't think, I'm not a member of ZANU-PF, I'm not a spokesperson for ZANU-PF, but I can assure you that there will be so many people uh, in ZANU PF who will be against the uh, the the, the a potential uh, desire to amend uh, the constitution. Zimbabwe has got 14 million people. Uh, ZANU PF was voted by literally uh, 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 whatever a million people. I'm sure in that one million people, uh, 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 the majority would not want to see an amendment of the of the constitution. So despite uh, the machinery of ZANU-PF, despite its control of state institutions, they, I can assure you there is no, there will never be agreement around amendment of that uh, uh, constitution. We have had a constitutional referendum in this country. We had a constitutional referendum on the 10th and 11th uh, of February uh, 2000. And the people of Zimbabwe, despite ZANU-PF's machinery, said no to a proposed uh, a constitution, the Chichigao uh, Siku Commission. I have no doubt in my mind that uh, uh, if they try to amend the constitution, this will be the biggest fight uh, of, our, of, our, of our generation, and, and people will resist this, including people uh, in uh, ZANU-PF. I come to Denis' question that uh, uh, participating in parliament is legitimizing uh, the 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 uh, the fraudulent election. I, 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 I with respect, I strongly uh, 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 disagree. Uh, participating in parliament does not le legitimize a process that was illegitimate and that was uh, not credible. In in political economy, and I can see a uh, uh, professor uh, Jonathan uh, Moyo, when you are in an opposition like us, an alternative movement, in a socially dominated uh, framework such as ours, when you're fighting one of the most complicated authoritarian regimes uh, on the continent, you do four things. The first thing you do is you protect zones of autonomy. The second thing you do is you build a credible uh, alternative. The third thing you do is you expose and isolate uh, the opponent. The fourth thing you do is you stretch the opponent. I view our participating in this election as protecting a, a zone of autonomy. That space that we got, those 103 seats uh, that we, we, we got, we have a right and a duty uh, to, to, to protect uh, those, uh, uh, those zones. Uh, to me, I've been a legislator for a long time. Parliament is a very powerful platform for, for defending the constitution, for defending uh, uh, citizen interests and advocating uh, citizens' interests. So to me, it's not a brainer. Uh, the elected MPs must participate in that, uh, in that uh, platform. What is required, uh, Danny, is to create a soft lending uh, for Zimbabwe, is to avoid another five years of stagnation, another five years of toxicity, another five years in respect of which the country veers to almost a genocidal a status quo, Rwanda in 1994, uh, for instance. So to me, there must be dialogue. To me, there must be discussion. I hope 
I hope SADC uh, will act on his report and allow a dialogue to take place so that there is a soft landing uh, for this country. We can't afford uh, another another five years uh, of the same ossification that we've seen in the last five years. As I'm talking to you right now, thousands and thousands of Zimbabweans are trying to cross crocodile infested Limpopo into South Africa. Thousands are applying for visas at the British embassy, at the, at the, at the, at the American uh, embassy. That's not good enough. That's not good enough. So this election is triggering yet another vicious uh, wave of uh, immigration, illegal and otherwise. We've become the sick men uh, of, 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 of the region. Uh, I would submit that uh, let's find a sustainable uh, a, a solution to the Zimbabwean a, a, a crisis, and that sustainable solution requires uh, uh, the 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 funding by Sadiq and requires a, a dialogue. Sorry, uh, may I just say, uh, sir, uh, you did not per, uh, answer my question. Um, I asked you um, what makes you think that um, after these five years that Zanu PF cannot churn out another leader. Um, as you allude that ZANU-PF is a political machine, um, what makes you think that ZANU-PF may even attempt to to amend the constitution? What makes you think that ZANU-PF cannot churn out another leader? No, 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 I didn't say that. Uh, on the on the contrary, on the contrary, uh, on the contrary, uh, I said, uh, listen exactly to what I said. I say that uh, I hope they will not be moved to amend the constitution. I, I hope the incumbent president, President Emerson Dambozum Nangagwa, will not be seduced to want to amend the constitution because that will divide uh, this country and set this country on a dangerous uh, precipice. We don't want that. That's my submission. Uh, and I said there are 14 million people, including people in ZANU, who can become uh, presidents in this country. That's what I said. But I also want, I also want that uh, the fact that he doesn't wish to amend the constitution does not mean that we don't have a succession challenge on our on our hands the the running made provisions were removed uh, by 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 parliament through constitutional amendment number 1 uh, of 2018 uh, uh, in before they were removed the first running mate would succeed the president now we don't have that meaning that even if the the, the mayor removal or the mayor the mayor refused to be seduced by the demon of wanting to amend the constitution. That uh, means that we are now back squarely to where we were when President Mugabe was alive, which is the succession question and how it is resolved. And I hope it can be resolved amicably and 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 and, and legally and with decent. That is my submission. Okay, thank you. I'm, I'm satisfied with your answer. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr. Beauty. Um, Bashwana wishes to speak. Uh, please unmute, unmute your microphone. Yeah, uh, thanks, Zimlife, and uh, thanks to 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 to, to Comrade Beauty there. Uh, I've got two questions for uh, Mr. Beauty, um, mainly on the issues of uh, the, 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 the 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 Constitution itself. Uh, number one, I want uh, I would uh, kindly ask. Uh, Mr. Beatty, about the processes which happened uh, in his political parties, uh, po political party, which in so many, uh, you know, millions of Zimbabweans were left, you know, uh, uh, you know, with no words to comment or to say about the processes uh, which seems to be, uh, you know, controlled in one man's office. I would give example for uh, councillor court at the, 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 the new councillor for what for? where he was uh, then, you know, right now as it is in terms of the laws, Mr. Bita, I, I, I cannot lecture him about the laws. Who is being, uh, uh, you know, I would say detected to the people of Blawayo to say Mr. Kota should be a mayor of, Ara of Blawayo, yet there is a process which are supposed to be followed in terms of the uh, Urban Council Act of uh, 2015, uh, uh, you know, and so forth. I want Mr. Beatty to explain to us this accession of Nelson Chamisa, the, uh, his president. 
of detecting to people this one should be this this, should, this one should be this what kind of leadership as you say yourself that you are alternative and basing on what happened on your elect, 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 elective processes or whatever selection processes which left so many millions of Zimbabwean you know unbelievable where we ended up having in ballot papers four or five candidates or three candidates two candidates for one ward of one constituents and then lastly I, I, I want Mr. B to probably to explain to us the, 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 the issue of delimitation. Because the opposition, in this case, I would say the opposition, which is um, CC. CC actually, in its uh, reasoning, they said that we didn't go to the court to challenge this uh, election outcome simply because uh, 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 the courts are captured or kind of or the courts are going to be biased in terms of the, uh, the, 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 the packages or whatever, the remunerations which were given to the judges. But at the same time, we've got opposite MPs who benefited on the, e benefited on the last sitting, 40,000, 50,000 case and so forth. We discussed about this issue. So I want, I want him to balance us here. Where is this supposed to be done? And end, I'll end by saying, in their reasoning as well, they quoted uh, 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 Mr. Monzor to say Mr. Monzor, I went to court and uh, his matter was dismissed. But these are the very same people who were saying Monzora doesn't want to go to the election. He wants to give Zanupev another, you know, leapfrog to, to contest in this election. So I want, is this political statements or are now the reality of life that Zimbabweans should receive from the, you know, from the politicians who are going to benefit in these uh, kind of processes, uh, as we as we as we can uh, you know talk about. Thank you so much, uh, uh, the, the 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 Zim Life, and uh, thanks so much, uh, Comrade BT, to grace this platform. I appreciate. Uh, th th thanks, uh, Bashona. I don't know whether um, uh, Mr. BT would like to answer that because it's a bit of a, I think let a, a me diversion two, from. Yeah, let sorry. me have two three. Let me have two three more questions. Okay, all right. There's a gentleman uh, with the... Uh, and if you yeah. if the person's asking can ask their name so that I can write them. And remember. Okay, okay, that'll be very useful. Uh, <laughs> please go ahead. Uh, I, th I think it says K-E-K. -E -K. Uh, yeah, Danny was before him with his hand up, but if you'd like to... Oh, uh, okay, sure. Okay. Uh, but I thought we'd, we'd already given a chance to Danny to speak. I don't know. Uh, Danny, go ahead. I've spoken, before. I've spoken before, but if he allows yeah. me, I can just be quick about it. Uh, Miti, I'm sorry, but your response to my question was unsatisfactory. Um, first of all, we had the same situation in the last term, you know, for previous three or four terms, and uh, MDC was in parliament, and it failed to deliver on the reforms that were needed. It uh, failed to prevent the constitution from being amended uh, in the last term. It's failed miserably, actually. And currently, Zanupia still has a majority where they can push ordinary legislation. Uh, <laughs> and we know what kind of legislation they like pushing. And Triple C can stop it with, the, with, its, uh, with its current uh, number of MPs and so forth. From, from my own opinion, Triple C has no bargaining power to bring Zanupia to the table, regardless of the SADC and AU reports, which... ZANU-PF is completely discrediting and will not, you know, bend to unless real pressure is applied. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I, I trust and believe from, from, from previous and past references that they are not going to be able to deliver the kind of things that they are promising right now because we have learned from this from the past. We have seen it before. This is not an attack. This is an appreciation of the reality and a plea to change strategy. And the councillors, the same the same dynamic uh, is with our councillors. We all know they don't possess the kind of power that they need to address the kind of problems that are bedeviling our communities. Very soon they'll be telling us that no PF and the ministry are blocking us and doing this and doing that. The circumstances haven't changed. What I thought Triple C was going to do was, before they step into parliament, at least apply the kind of pressure that guarantees um, you know, uh, 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 an environment that allows for them to perform. Right now, those, those, those impediments still exist. And yet you're still promising to deliver. 
and you have not been able to say, okay, if we fail to deliver, this is how we are going to hold ourselves accountable to you because you continue to fail. And I know some, for some, for the most part, it's not your fault. Our new baby is very ruthless and we get that. But it's about time we started standing with Zimbabwean people and taking a little bit more uh, difficult decisions and stop taking the easy way out. This is the easy way out, I believe. And the more we continue to continue on this cycle, the more the ordinary person suffers. While you are respectfully saying, and uh, your MPs and so forth, enjoy the perks, enjoy the taxes, enjoy the, 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 the status of being in parliament, while the ordinary Zimbabwean is being deprived of his land by foreigners, while the ordinary Zimbabwean cannot get into a hospital and be treated for simple ailments and diseases, while the student in school is failing to have books and so forth, but you are there in parliament getting cars, getting 40,000s and so forth, failing to deliver. Now, this is, like I said, this is not an attack. This is an appreciation of the reality. And I would like to hear something different, to at, at least have time frames to say, we are going to achieve this. We have taken this okay. step within this time. We are going to achieve this. And if we fail, uh, please hold us accountable in this way. Uh, many thanks. Thanks. Is that beauty? Yeah. So, so I, you know, I, I, I came here to speak on the, the last term uh, president of Zimbabwe dive into the uh, unknown. That's that's the mandate. Um, I, I'm not I'm not privy to many of the issue internal issues you were raising, and I certainly don't have a mandate to speak uh, for them. Uh, but all I can tell you is that um, is that. Um, we held uh, uh, successful processes. We have produced uh, uh, 103 MPs under extremely uh, difficult uh, circumstances. Uh, we have prevented Zanupi from having a two-thirds, uh, uh, you know, 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 majority. And I think that that should be uh, that should be recognised. Uh, oftentimes, uh, it's easy to blame, uh, which is understandable. But I think that uh, citizens must also understand that they have agency, they are actors. Uh, don't be uh, objects uh, of, of your environment. You, 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 you must have citizen uh, agency. The issue of delimitation, uh, I think del delimitation was a, was, a, was a disaster. I think delimitation was, a, was a illegal uh, and, and, and unconstitutional. The constitution is very clear that constituencies are supposed to be divided uh, equally. We had 5.4 million uh, registered voters as of May uh, 2022. That meant that uh, the average constituents ought to have been uh, around 28,000. The constitution uh, allows a variation of, uh, 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 you know, you know, you know, uh, 20 uh, percent, which would have meant that uh, the smallest constituency should have been around 24,000 uh, people, uh, the biggest constituents uh, around 30,000. But we had constituencies that are around 34,000, and in some cases 20,000. So the 20% rule uh, was not um, uh, was not uh, 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 respected. Uh, I I think the I think uh, the, the 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 quest towards a, a proper delimitation is not over. Whether it's going to be done by parliament itself pushing a resolution, or whether it's going to be done by uh, courts of law, because I'm aware of uh, outstanding legal cases. Uh, I, I'm not a prophet. I, I, I can't tell you. But what I can tell you as a, as a lawyer uh, uh, is that uh, the delimitation was improper and we strongly argued uh, against the same uh, on the 13th, 14th and 15th of January uh, 2023 when the issue was debated uh, in uh, in uh, a, 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 a parliament. The issue, uh, the issues that uh, Denny, uh, you raise. Uh, I, I think I think that um, you, you you can't blame us for the passage of constitutional amendment number one and constitutional amendment number number two, and those were terrible constitutional amendments, particularly uh, constitutional amendment uh, number two, uh, which in one 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 a piece of legislation, uh, thirty five amendments uh, uh, were made. Uh, but you forget one thing that uh, when those bills were actually debated 
uh, most of us had actually been uh, recalled. And I, I suspect that some of the reason why some of us were removed, in particular myself, was because they wanted to push uh, those constitutional, uh, 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 you know, amendments. Uh, we we took the 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 illegal constitutional amendments to to, to court. Uh, we have lost. There's only one constitutional uh, challenge that is pending, uh, based on uh, the basic structure doctrine that you can amend the constitution amending its basic structure, it loses its identity. Therefore, it's not a constitutional uh, am am amendment. The bottom line is that uh, the, twen sorry, the 20 March uh, 2020 uh, judgment in the matter of uh, uh, Tokozani Kupe uh, versus Nelson Chamisa, which gave our party to, uh, to Dr. Monzora and Dr. Kupe, really affected and yet, you know, disastrous consequences on our presence uh, in the ninth uh, session uh, of parliament and allowed the smooth passage of those constitutional uh, bills. So we can't be uh, judged uh, on that. Uh, I, I think that um, there have been challenges uh, in local authorities. It's again easy to blame uh, the councillors. But I think one of the problems you forgot is that uh, the, the Urban Councils Act and the Rural District Councils Act have not been harmonized uh, with the uh, new constitution, the 2013 uh, constitution. In particular, there is no respect to uh, 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 Chapter 14 of the constitution. That makes it clear that local authorities have to be run by those that are elected uh, uh, in, in council. Uh, section 274, Section 275 to Section 278 say this. So you, you have a law, the Urban Councils Act, which says in Section 314 that the Minister of Local uh, Government, uh, the esteemed July Moyo, I'm sure he's going to be reappointed, uh, can reverse, can issue a directive that reverses any decision that a local authority can 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 make, and we saw him abusing uh, this power. Uh, this power, the George Nick's uh, Pomona dump, dumping site uh, case is a case in point. Sito Ferrari said on the seventh of July, uh, twenty twenty two, and reversed that agreement, uh, nullified that agreement. July Moy writes a letter on the twelfth of July, saying reinstating uh, that agreement and paying George Nix from amounts that are due to the city of Harare in respect of uh, uh, devolution. It's not just uh, Section three hundred and fourteen of the Urban Councils Act, which is uh, pernicious. You have the provisions of the Urban Councils Act, which obliged all procurement to be done in terms of the state procurement board and not the local authority itself. You have provisions in the Urban Councils Act that require the budget of local authorities to be uh, consented to by the Minister of Local Government and the Minister of uh, Finance. You have in the Urban Councils Act provisions that create a local government board that says the city of the, any city cannot employ a senior official without approval of the local government board, which is a synonym for the Minister of Local Government. So you have got total emasculation of local authorities by the minister, by, by, the, by the central government. And one of the things that is most pernicious is, of course, the issue of devolution. Devolution has not been actualized uh, seven, so almost 10 years after 2023. The law actualizing chapter 14 of the uh, constitution actualizing devolution has still not been uh, passed. We've, had, we've just had elections right now in which provincial uh, representatives have been, have been elected, but they're not going to serve because the devolution law has not been enacted, notwithstanding that there are three or four judgments obliging uh, the government to actually enact uh, that uh, law. So challenges are there. Challenges are there. That's why we need citizen agency and we need the activism of the citizen in their organizations, in civic society, and of course in parliament. Thank you very much, Mr. Viti. Um, thanks for your insights, and uh, we appreciate your time. I see uh, Dr. Mpofu is, uh, is back on. Uh, hopefully, you can try him now before he. Chief Matutu, uh, can you hear me? He, before he's. Uh... Yes, I can hear you, sir. 
please go ahead. Hello. Matoto, can you hear yes, me? Yes, uh, Dr. Mpofu, please go ahead. Yes, I can hear you, sir. Yes, you can go ahead, sir. Thank you so much. I hope the the colleagues in attendance can also hear me. I've been struggling to to stay on here. Um, I must express uh, my gratitude to Tendai BD for dealing, I think, effectively with the legal fundamentals around this topic. Uh, that homework that uh, he has done allows me then to deal with, um, I think, the political issues that might be hanging by the side. Uh, the interesting part of this topic that we are treating today is the unknown part that we are dealing with a kind of unknown, a mysterious kind of future. But uh, deploying historical observation and analysis and political analysis itself, we can find ways of knowing what might happen and how that might happen. To start with, we are dealing with a presidency that is occupied by a president that is knowable and that is in this case known. And the first question in our attempt will be, how did that president come to be? What is the political history that has produced this presidency and this president? How did he seek, find, and keep our political power thus far? If we look at those questions and we apply them on the subject matter at hand, which is the presidency of this president, we might actually be able to, from some reasonable grounds, say something about what might happen. Uh, that takes, that takes us to the history of ZANU-PF as it has come to be, right from the camps in Mozambique up to its incumbency in the present. In the present. Uh, I want to drop the observation that was made by um, Masi Pulastole and um, John Makumbe, our late uh, professors, who wrote a paper which observed that this unit, this entity, which I call a political cult, called ZANU-PF, arrived from the Bush War, occupied or possessed by a one-party state psychology, which means that they did not wish to entertain or were they ever sold to any idea of multi-party democracy. And what were they going to do? They were going to deploy a combination of force and fraud to seek, find, and keep power under the life presidency of one Robert Mugabe and the de facto one-party state of Ozan PF. I want to observe that that one-party state psychology has not left Zan PF and ZAN PF as it is has not left that psychology. And that has led in the history from 1980 the political cult to commit a major genocide, to practice a state and party terrorism, and some acts of ethnic cleansing, and several incidents of choreographing and designing the violent. Uh, elimination of political opponents within ZANU PF and without. So that history is the history that has given us this presidency and the president that occupies uh, that place. So uh, elections in Zimbabwe have um, always happened then, as Marx taught us, first as a tragedy, then as um, a farce, and I think now elections are happening in Zimbabwe as catastrophes that leave many victims behind as that combination of force and fraud plays out. Clearly, that's a problem of political leadership. But that problem of political leadership must not uh, blinker 
or blind us to the huge problem in Zimbabwe of political followership. In practicing acts of uh, electoral fraud, political violence, state and uh, party terrorism, genocide, and ethnic cleansing, these political leaders have had choirs of psychophants, flatterers, and other types of followers urging them on and creating around them a universe of support to say that what these leaders are doing is all right. Some of these do it for personal benefits, partisan benefits, and some, I think, they do it just out of political evil. And political evil being one of the forces that I can confidently claim has produced this particular presidency and this particular president. And that political evil has expressed itself clearly in the Kukurawund genocide and other spectacular incidents of um, political violence. Now for us to be able to try and not predict but project what um, Emerson Minangakwa's next political move might be, we need to look exactly at the genealogy and the provenances of his, his kind of leadership. Um, first, we must start with the question of guilt. Uh, the combination of the Kukura Wundi genocide, the now well-known DRC blood diamonds, the many cases of uh, internal assassination of enemies within ZANU-PF and the assassination of external enemies that are not in ZANU-PF that are opposed to it, massive uh, cases of corruption that can be called mega corruption. One example being the gold mafia. And another example being uh, one uh, incident that Robert Mkabe highlighted a few months before he was dethroned. The 15 billion US dollars that disappeared uh, from uh, the Chiazwa proceeds. So um, a president that uh, populates a presidency that is punctuated by these guilty producing incidents becomes a person that is afraid, a person that is insecure. As uh, we know from classical thinking by now that the guilty are afraid, they flee even when no one pursues, they defend themselves even no one, when no one has attacked and they are ready to attack anytime. So, um, Emerson Nangakwa has been produced by and many other forces that may not allow him to imagine being out without the security and the immunity that the presidential office offers. That is the kind of precarity and the kind of fragility of his kind and his quality of the presidents. Because of these incidents that are killed producing, um, he cannot be without power. As a result, he will do anything to keep the power, to keep the office for the security and the immunity that it offers him. The option then it will be, do you force him out by unconstitutional means? How do you mobilize the urgency of Zimbabweans that um, Jendai Piti has been talking about to compel this kind of uh, incumbent to respect the political will of the people of Zimbabwe? After the question of fear, uh, Chief Matu, today is the question, after the question of guilt, there is the question of fear. Guilty individuals are also terrified individuals. Terrified in the sense in which uh, sometime in 2003, uh, Doris Lessing actually described Robert Mugabe himself then as a terrified little man. 
Guru daily performs some acts of bravado, some acts of courage, and some acts of fearlessness that actually conceal rather than reveal the actualities of fear that occupy this individual. We are dealing with a president that is afraid. Because of the crimes committed, because of the massive ill-gotten wealth, because of the many victims produced, and because of the en many enemies inside and outside Zanpia that surround the individual. And that fear alone makes the individual very uh, dangerous. I I'm experiencing some echoes. I don't know where they are coming from. Can I still be heard, Chief? Well, it's, uh, yes, yes, we can hear you. Mr. Beatty, uh, please. Uh, yes, you can go ahead. I think it's sorted. It's fixed. Thank you so yeah, much. Yeah, you can go ahead. I was um, trying to provide some clarity on the question of uh, fear that proceeds from the guilt that occupies um, the incumbent. And this fear makes this uh, individual uh, dangerous in that they will uh, always resort to the available instruments of um, violence, fraud, uh, disappearances, eliminations, and poisonings. There's a very interesting paper written by um, Professor Miles Tendi uh, about uh, Zimbabwean intelligence and uh, presidential succession. I think it's a 2013 excuse me, publication. And um, one of their figures from the intelligence sector that uh, Milestone interviewed disclosed that actually one of the tools at their disposal is the tool of poisoning opponents. And uh, this agent actually disclosed to Milestone that um, these agents in terms of the poisons that are used were sourced from, uh, is it Kazakhstan? And the way they are deployed and the way they operate is that um, they manifest in the body symptoms of uh, generic diseases that are now known. So some of the poisons will simulate symptoms of HIV, others symptoms of sugar diabetes, others symptoms of uh, cancers, and other symptoms of high blood pressure and other um, diseases that we have come to to understand. Zimbabweans and all of us here can just look around uh, in the Zimbabwean political landscape and see just how many political figures were exhausted, were eliminated uh, using what appeared like natural uh, causes, including the the COVID-19 um, pandemic that we saw opportunistically targeting especially those uh, individuals from the security sector that uh, participated actively in the coup that dethroned Robert Mkabe in um, 2017. So we can see the kind of political climate, the kind of uh, environment, the kind of individual and the kind of presidency that is in place and the many dangers and the many uh, possibilities of um, darkness, blood, and other uh, uh, calamities. So I hope I've um, managed to flesh out the question of um, fear that occupies this individual and the institution and the office that they currently occupy and, and, and the dangers that confront Zimbabwe. Quickly, I want to rush to the question of um, what kind of regime is this? Because if we are to project what might happen to us, we need to look closely at the nature of the regime, politically and otherwise. I've previously characterized this regime as a native colonialist regime in that the way they've held on to power through domination by force, that is a colonial way of doing things. The way friends, family, and France 
of the president have monopolized the Zimbabwean economy. Think about the gold mafia just as a small tip of the large iceberg. That is also a colonial way of um, hanging a country's uh, economy as they have been hanging the polity. So what does a native colonialist regime do? It does everything colonial except that it is native, populated by natives of the country. That tells us then that we must look forward to another future of political domination and economic exploitation. What these uh, individuals in this political cult have done, they have put in place the exact, the exact economic and political conditions that forced some Zimbabweans in the 70s to leave their homes, to leave their villages, to go and conduct an armed a liberation strategy against Rhodesian secular colonialism. That defines a native um, colonialist regime. Quickly after that, and I hope uh, colleagues in the opposition and in the civil society know what is done, what has been done elsewhere in the world to deal with colonialist regimes, how to fight against them, how to resist them, and how to push back against them. That, that's what needs to be deployed. Quickly, I want to move on to the, the huge prospects of uh, another military coup in Zimbabwe. I've actually said this before, that all the ingredients for another coup are in place. What is left is the actual mixing and the actual cooking. Why do I say that? Not just because coups beget coups, but um, what we have because of the coup in 2017, which was successfully sold to SATIC and the AU as something else and not a coup, but it was a coup, we have a politicized army, an army that is composed of soldiers that now know that it is possible and it can be done successfully to dethrone a government militarily. That's one ingredient. Another ingredient is the fierce internal divisions in ZANU-PF and in the security sector. Divisions that will not be publicly performed, but that we know exist. The third ingredient is a ready population. Zimbabweans have been pushed so far against the political wall that they are now ready for any form of political change, even if it's unconstitutional. The fourth ingredient Mr. Chairman, it seems we have lost the speaker. Hello, yeah, 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 I'm back. Zimbabwe network challenges here. Hello. Uh, th th thanks, uh, thanks, Ch thanks, uh, Dr. Mpofu. We'll keep trying to reconnect with you. Hello, uh, yes, hopefully... yes, can you hear me, everybody? Uh, okay, there's one. Let me take over. Um, while while we're trying to reconnect with uh, Dr. Mpofu, I think uh, I'll give Metric the floor challenges. to I'll give the floor to uh, Mr. K. E. K. You wanted to ask uh, Mr. Beatty a question? Please go ahead. Yeah. yeah, thank you for having me up here. Um, and again, um, some of my questions might um, is more like a lot of my reading, but 
Um, I guess in, in a few questions I have is um, obviously it seems like the last amendment was coming like in 2017. And my question is what, what was the current, because with the election now kind of seemingly it's taking place on the 23rd, what, what was the current, because I don't necessarily know, but that's why I'm asking because I have a further question, is what was the necessarily current modality of how was the, the balloting done? Was it done via paper balloting or electronic balloting or both? That's my first question because I have a question to that. Can I have another question, Mdu? Yeah, 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 sure. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have uh, many yeah, requests. Yeah, it seems uh, we are having many right challenges here. So we can uh, proceed. Please, uh, KEK, -E -K, sorry to, to yeah. answer your question. You asked if uh, there was electronic balloting, you say? Uh, yeah. No, we do not uh, use electronic uh, voting in the moment. Sorry. Okay. So is that... Does do people feel that maybe the form of voting itself is a deterrent for people to even show up for voting so people don't vote because they know like them trying to do a paper vote or a ballot vote is one of wasted time so they don't show up even if they want change and two what is the reality that technologies can be explored more to succeed more things like digital voting or a vote with um, whether people understand what this term is or not, blockchain technology for transparency of voting that uh, certain other you know societies and nations are leaning towards to succeed. These sort of aspects that a vote was illegitimate, the vote was a fraud, the vote was manipulated. And um, so... That's one question is like, is what do people feel like the technology, the advancements of technology on a global level can help or how far, how much farther out can like genocides and, and frauds and uh, military coups happen until like we're, we're, people are beating their heads against the wall to maybe just make something easier and simpler, which is innovation of, again, technology for more transparency to a legitimate vote. Um, if that's not being applied right now. Um, also, um, it, it like how much is the, yeah, how much that type of push in a general consensus being put out in medias, um, like even like this place, this venue on this app, in the news in Zimbabwe, in papers about, you know, lifting up technological modernization to help combat this, these violences uh, unneeded deaths, unneeded repressions to continue like that um, is a question. Thanks, I uh, thanks, for, yeah. thanks, Chief. I, I, I'm sure uh, Mr. Beat will pass a comment. Uh, Mr. Beat, yeah. you yes. can go ahead yes. and uh, respond to the question. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so this is the thing. Uh, for a long time, we have uh, pushed uh, for biometric. Uh, voting. So what you have in Zimbabwe is that you have got a biometric voters roll, but the the voting itself is is manual and and archaic. Um, the uh, our registrar, this is the office that collects all data on beds uh, and on deaths that issue is identity cards and passports, is actually fairly advanced in respect of uh, collection of data, in respect of uh, collection of biometric uh, data. So the transition to biometric uh, uh, voting, the transition to the use of blockchain and modern technology, technologies in voting should be so easy. But I think the reason why they have not implemented it is because they are aware that it limits... Once, once the situation... Uh, and the infrastructure has been put, it, 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 it uh, limits uh, avenues of, uh, of stealing an election, and it also provides ready-made data uh, to anyone uh, not uh, rather dissatisfied uh, with an election. I don't think that Zimbabwe will successfully 
resist the floods of change. Uh, an election was uh, held as recent uh, as October of 2022 in Lesotho. It was biometric uh, uh, voting uh, technology. They were using uh, tablets. Uh, the Kenyan election as well in August of last year, 2022, uh, was also uh, a biometric in technology. I've been, uh, I've been to Somaliland of all places, which is not even a, a state recognized uh, by the United Nations uh, in Yegisa and other provinces. Uh, uh, despite their challenges, they were in fact using a biometric uh, voting and, uh, and, and tablets. And anyone who has been privy to those tablets and biometric uh, uh, voting, it will resolve a lot of uh, the trust deficit that is associated with our uh, own electoral uh, system and our own elections. And, and I hope that uh, uh, we, we can move uh, to biometric uh, uh, voting because the data is actually biometric. If you go to a, to a registry office right now, they can give you your passport, they can give you your ID almost immediately because they've got data uh, on, on, on everyone. We are moving towards a, a digital age and there's no reason why Zimbabwe should not uh, adopt a biometric uh, voting. All right, thank, thank you, uh, Mr. Mr. Bet. So, just a gentle reminder, uh, our discussion we are having here, and uh, we are discussing about uh, the constitution that was updated, uh, adopted in 2013, uh, which introduced the uh, term limits of presidents, uh, limiting a president to two five-year terms. So, President Emerson Mnangagwa, we have just been uh, uh, at the home, uh, he has been at the home, he is now at the home, has been controversially been inaugurated for a second and a final term. And uh, in our history in Zimbabwe, this is the first time of the country to have uh, the president's term that starts as a countdown to his exit. So just to try and understand what the next five years might look like, uh, we are enjoined by the former finance minister, Tendai Biti, and uh, Dr. William Jethro Ampofu, a researcher at the WITS University in South Africa. So, yeah, we continue as we try to wind up. Uh, if anybody has some um, questions, you might raise your hands up and uh, you can uh, put your questions to uh, Mr. Beatty and uh, our doctor from WITS University, Mr. Jethro. Yes, can I go ABM. ahead? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, sure. All right, thank you, thank you. Um, uh, first of all, I wanted to address uh, Jethro um, a little bit because uh, a lot of what he see, what what he was talking about seems to be um, conspiracy theories uh, with no proof, with no names of uh, of these people that, that he says were negatively affected by by the Zimbabwe government. So I'm very very worried about that. Um, you know, we would like, to, as an esteemed researcher that he claims to be, we would like to hear certain names um of, of people that have been murdered or that have been uh, uh that uh, that have been um oh, what did he say um uh, that were um uh, that were injected with 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 some uh, with some sort of thing that that makes them seem like they die of natural causes because um that is a huge conspiracy theory um coming from a learned person and he does not give us a, a name to even uh, for reference in in that regard you know, which is very worrying because we do hear these conspiracy theories that go a long way, um, and yet there is no actual proof. Um, so that's very, very worrying to me. Um, uh, secondly, um, diving into into this unknown, um, uh, uh, Mr. BT, and I appreciate your presence. Thank you very much, guys. Um, we 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 dove into the unknown um, when we had the GNU in uh, two thousand and eight. Um, where you were finance minister, um, uh, and of which th during that uh, during that period as well, um, the MDC also partook in 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 the in the writing of the new constitution that we, that now governs Zimbabwe, um, uh, and we took a deep deep dive into that. Um, we we saw um, some sort of. Um, E economic accession um we, we saw some some of our our economy getting better 
but then it seems to to me at that point that it was only artificial um and was only at the uh, it was only because um western funders were essentially um releasing funds into zimbabwe and uh, then it seemed like artificial growth because um it soon went down and there was no sustainable economic growth that that, that actually entailed your um ministry, your your period as finance minister but right now, as we speak, um, as we're going into the second term of our uh, of MSM Nagogoy's second and final term, um, one can argue that there there has been uh, pillars of sustainable economic growth that uh, that have been put in place. Um, for uh, for example, um, we over the last five years during his first term, we we saw that um, there was the uh, banning of exportation of of raw granite. Of which granite is is something that is used by a lot of people because people are building houses in Zimbabwe, um, uh, and then that that meant that granite that granite had to be processed in Zimbabwe because our president saw that um, we're sending raw granite over to whoever is mining it uh, to their countries and then they process it. And then secondly, um, the most uh, the more important one was um, the the banning of exportation of of, of raw lithium, which also. Um, um, uh, you know, regardless of whether uh, he's here or not, but those policies are going to encourage economic growth and employment in Zimbabwe. Um, we have also seen um, over the last five years, uh, when it comes to sustainable economic growth or pillars of sustainable economic growth, um, we have we have seen how um, our president has been working hard to ensure that electricity and power. Uh, ha, is something that, that that is that is constant and uninterrupted, and oh, as much as that is still a, pro, a work in progress, they, but then there is progress. And then also, we have also seen over the last five years that uh, Zimbabwe's uh, GDP growth has consistently grown. We have also seen uh, over the last five years um, that um, we uh, we broke three records of production. Um, the first one being gold. The second one is the second one being wheat and uh, this year being uh, tobacco um, uh, those things are uh, are they not a reason for a positive outlook on Zimbabwe when it comes to economic growth because uh, as much as we we may want to say that um, if somebody ch if we change power uh, things are going to change overnight that's never going to be the case especially when we're considering that we have uh, this law that is called uh, the Zimbabwe uh, Zimbabwe Democ Democrat Democracy Economic Recovery Act that is called Zidera um, that is also uh, hindering us in our growth um, but we are still going towards uh, our growth and uh, the numbers don't lie so is there not a reason i'll, I'll be learning is there not a reason then to be uh, more more uh, more positive in the outlook of zimbabwe in the next five years thanks for your question uh, uh, lord please go ahead lord um uh, thank you very much <coughs> lord lord master thank you very much um i think we all can agree that we've gone through a phase of um, totally crisis. We're um, totally destroyed the Zimbabwe uh, economy. I'm not sure if uh, anyone can hear. Lord, have, Lord Master, please go ahead. Yes, can, I can hear him. Yeah, I can hear him. Okay, sure. Okay, I have uh, three questions for Honorable BT. Uh, one, um, does he think? So it becomes political. Uh, doesn't he think now it's time for? Can anyone hear him? See. They can hear me, but... Uh, yeah, um, I, I can hear him, but then, Lord uh, Ryan, I think you need to drop down and come back because people can't hear you. Sure. Uh, the villager, please go ahead. All right. Mr. Bitte, I think uh, you can answer uh, to the questions which has been raised so far. Can anyone hear? Yes, we can hear him. Okay. Yeah, so I'll answer. I hope I hope uh, we are now moving to conclusion do. But I'll, I'll, I'll Absolutely, answer. Absolutely, sir. Yeah, yeah. So I think that um, I think that uh, what uh, Jethro was was talking about the assassinations. Uh, uh, the strange deaths, 
those are not anecdotes. Those are, you might not have given names, uh, but uh, this is common cause. Uh, Zanu was not born yesterday. Zanu was not born yesterday. Uh, violence has always been a systematic, uh, inextricable arsenal uh, of, uh, our, uh, of our history and the liberation, uh, the liberation uh, uh, narrative. Um, and unfortunately, it is in fact the narrative of, of, of Zimbabwe. As I, I keep on arguing, this country since 1890 is not, is not known more than 10 years of uninterrupted uh, a, 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 a peace. We are, we are set in a permanent a, a crisis. And the liberation struggle itself uh, was, uh, was uh, uh, lacerated uh, with the histories uh, of assassinations, uh, uh, you know, you know. I can give you names. Uh, uh, the most, the most famous name being uh, uh, Chairman Chitepo, uh, who was uh, who was assassinated uh, in March uh, of 1975. Uh, the death, for instance, on the 26th of uh, December, uh, 1999, uh, of uh, Commander Josiah, uh, you know, you know, you know, you know, you know, you know, Tongo Gara, the the Nari Rebellion. Of 19 January 1976, and those that were eliminated, sorry, of 1970, uh, you know, five, uh, and and those that were killed, people like Thomas Bads and and and, and so forth. Very unfortunate stories, very unfortunate incidents uh, that happened uh, in 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 Zambia, with many people being buried in places like Chifombo in Zambia. Then you've got January 1976, the the uprisings of the young revolutionaries, the Vashanti. Uh, led by people like uh, Zinashe Machingura, again assassinations during the liberation uh, struggle itself. Then you've got 1978, the uprising uh, of people like uh, like uh, Ahmad Ziripi, Rugare Gumbo, and others. Many people were killed. Post-independence, two years after independence, we had Kukura Wundi, 81 to, 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 to 87. We had Operation Murambatsina. We had the violence associated with the 2008 election. Uh, 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 you, know, m- you know, my generation in the change movement, we lost thousands and thousands of uh, kedas, the likes of Tundera Indira and so forth. So what, what Jethro was talking about uh, is not anecdotal. Uh, and, and, and it has been written a lot. Written a lot. Uh, he referred to he referred to Miles Tendi. I think you ought to read uh, Miles Tendi's book uh, on 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 General uh, Mujuru. And every Zimbabwe knows that he was assassinated uh, in in 2012. So it, it's not anecdotal. It's not anecdotal uh, at all. Uh, I want to come to uh, to your characterization of. Um, the growth experience during the GNU as a bubble, or that it was inspired by money that came from from the West. Uh, far from it, we we hardly got any uh, overseas development assistance that was in excess of six hundred million dollars uh, uh, per year, which is in fact consistent with what uh, Mutuli has been receiving in the last uh, 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 you know you know five years. But we, we, we ran the economy on, on certain fundamentals. One of the fundamentals was that Yes, yes, my brother. You may need to mute and mute him. Then. Hello, can you? Hear all right. Me? Yes. Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, I can hear Mr. Uh, Bitti. Apologies for that. Okay. All right. So let me just conclude by saying that. Uh, okay. By saying that, um, since 2014 to now, the economy we have serious structural problems. And part of the problem is, has been an expansionary a fiscal a, a, a policy that has created uh, deficits, which deficits has been uh, monetized by the creation uh, of, of, of money. 
the introduction of the bond note in 2016 was was a disaster a complete disaster that led to the devaluation uh, of the Zimbabwean currency that led to the devaluation of uh, uh, Zimbabwean assets we lost uh, in in 2008 our pension industry lost US 5.86 billion uh, uh, dollars we've gone through two further losses in 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 2016 uh, where we lost value uh, by by 40%. And in 2019, when the government introduced the SI uh, 33 of 2019, these are massive losses, massive losses of people's income uh, without, uh, uh, you know, you know, uh, uh, you know, you know, compensation. The economy requires major structural uh, reform around number one, the issue of, 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 of currency. There's a threat, there's a talk of total demonetization of the of the US dollar and the result 100% to the local currency. I think that will be a disaster, a massive, massive uh, disaster that will see contraction of the economy, that will see the economy plunging uh, into a, 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 a recession which will soon graduate into a depression. I hope they won't uh, they won't do that. Number two uh, is 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 in, in, in inflation, and somehow, uh, uh, somehow, if you look at the exchange rate right now, the the US dollar is now trading at one is to uh, uh, seven thousand five hundred, one is to seven thousand eight hundred, meaning that we are already into a mode of an implosion of the exchange rate, an implosion uh, of, of, of 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 inflation, so. And, and I haven't spoken about the collapse of public uh, service, the public health uh, system. Schools opened yesterday. Thousands and thousands of students were not allowed back to school because of uh, school fees, which are being demanded in US dollars on a population that is unemployed or that is earning in RTGS uh, uh, dollars. I've just lost an aunt at Harare uh, Hospital. So I spent a few days visiting Harare Hospital. It's like a hospital in a, in, a, in, a, in a war zone. Basic drugs, basic infrastructure that's necessary in a basic hospital is, is not uh, available. So therefore, uh, therefore, I make the case for a soft lending uh, for Zimbabwe. The possibility of a coup uh, that Jethro uh, talks about is not... A, 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 you know, a, a possibility. It's probably a probability because the ingredients are there. How do you avoid that? You avoid that uh, through uh, creation uh, of a soft lending. So we are in a huge crisis. We are in a huge crisis uh, yet again. A crisis arising out of a, a, a stolen election. A crisis arising out of uh, a, 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 you know, you know, legitimacy. A crisis arising out of uh, weak institutions. A crisis arising out of an economy that is not growing, and and in the few pockets that it is growing, it's not shared, uh, uh, you know, growth. Uh, that situation requires leadership, not just the internal leadership, but also external leadership. Our situation requires the, the scaffolding of international law in the form of uh, SADC, in the form of the uh, African Union. If that doesn't happen, if that doesn't happen. As I said at the beginning, you are going to see massive implosion uh, of uh, immigrants across the length and breadth uh, of, uh, of uh, Zimbabwe. In South Africa, more than any other country, uh, will, will suffer uh, this uh, implosion. You are going to see massive uh, dislocation, increase in, in, in polarity, increase in, in, in politics of uh, uh, ex- ex- exclusion, a, a, a total uh, a, a stalemate total decapitation of the nation state as we know it uh, uh, today. And this is the fatal ground for a military coup. Nobody wants this. Nobody uh, likes this. Uh, but uh, we are talking about it so that there is necessary essential leadership and agents of the citizen to address uh, these omissions and commissions. Uh Thank you very much, uh, Comrade Beatty. I think uh, we have had you here for an hour and 45 minutes. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Uh, it's unfortunate we lost um, Dr. Mpofu, um, but perhaps uh, <clears throat> uh, some other time.
And thanks to our readers. We appreciate your support. As always, good night.